questions. There will be microphones roaming. As previously, please could you raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. This is your opportunity to contribute to the discussion so that we may better learn from one another. And again, if you could identify yourself by your name and the organization that you represent, please. We have a question from the gentleman here. There are many speakers to talk about the linkage between the university and industry. So actually in our country, uh, it is a major challenges. Actually, I'm Dr. Suwen uh, from Myanmar, responsible for the Department of Higher Education. So actually, we would like to linkage between the, our university and industry. So I would like to ask only one question. How can we initiate to get the linkage between our university and industry? Thank you. The question, how best to initiate the link between university and industry? Judy? Unfortunately, I don't think there's actually a very simple answer to that question. <laughs> the, the, the linkages often come from many different places. It's understanding in your universities and research institutions, there'll already be existing linkages. Your researchers will be working with people that work in industry most likely. Your students will go out and will work in industry. And those person-to-person -person linkages are some of the most important ones, often in and developing a relationship with an industry partner. Developing a really high-level strategic interaction with a company like Rolls-Royce takes many years and much investment in terms of understanding what the university's needs are, as well as what the industry partner's needs are. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty strategic assessment of what your, what your desires are and what your key, um, I guess, value is to industry and understanding which industry wants that value and then making a deliberate attempt to go and meet with them and build a relationship with them so that you get some sort of a win-win for everybody. I think that's absolutely correct. And I think the other source are your own alumni. So your graduates on top of the partnerships that your staff have uh, is a really good start because a lot of them will be working with different employers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from my point of view, uh, just thinking about you know, the imperatives from industry, I mean, think about the fact that industry actually wants to engage in, in, country, in developing countries. It's an important part of them, their, their own business development and, uh, and embedding themselves and building relationships up with key individuals and stakeholders within, the, within those countries. So there's a, there's a push there, you know, effectively from industry to want to come into, into developing countries. I think what, what you've got to do and what, you know, uh, countries like Myanmar and, and Vietnam have got to do is create the value proposition and create the, create the tag that sort of really draws industry in. So creating simple, simple mechanisms that allow industry to understand the, the security of their efforts are going to be, uh, is going to be you know, well placed. Um, and um, and you know we're not going to um, we're not going to be wasting our our time in terms of wanting to establish those sort of partnerships that you that you're seeking seeking. So to set, setting achievable targets, setting simple a simple long term vision of how you want to engage, and 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 having that repeatability up through the hierarchy of your management process through to government and through to the ministries is really key to establishing the confidence of industry to to look at uh, developing countries as an investment opportunity for for a, for a win-win outcome as i say you know it's not that those industries or some industry challenges can could be done almost anywhere in the world but part of an education strategy for a company like rolls royce is to develop the relationships in, in the countries that we want to be working with so that we can, we can achieve business success long term. So creating those win-win solutions is critical. I'm Ying from uh, Swinburne University of Technology. Uh, may I direct my question to Professor uh, Sefer? Um, could, could you please uh, share with us more on what uh, you mean by SME in Wales? Um, I mean, in terms of, you know, just an idea in terms of um, the scale and the size, um, possibly, you know, capital, something like that. And sorry for another question as well, is that, um, you know, unlike Rolls Royce, where, um, you know, they have R&D 
sit in place and then well established and they have a strong relationship with university. Uh, for SMEs, um, what sort of challenges that you encounter when approaching them um, for, for research collaboration? Um, are they ready, I mean, in terms of infrastructure and human resources for such kind of projects um, and, you know, some sort of things that uh, may prevent you from, you know, working with them on research collaboration? Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I don't think we work with a very definite definition of what an SME actually is. I think we see an SME as being a, a, a business that's lo located at a single location, primarily in Wales, but they can be as large as having 100 or 150 employees down to businesses that actually have just one employee, which is the business owner. So we, we, we don't use a tight definition. I think in the difficulties we have, probably more than anything, is actually having the businesses near us understand what we can offer is so that they actually know how we can help them. Many of the small businesses don't realize how a university can help them. And that's partly because they don't understand what universities do. And so I think the, the key trick is to build relations with them, to get them to understand what benefits having a university in their region can have for them. Um, so I think it's about a dialogue. I, if I was to reflect back on our history, um, over the last 10 years, I think one of the mistakes we've made, which is worth bearing in mind, is the thing I'm trying to correct at the moment, is that we've often tended to assume that we know what is best for them, that it's sort of a university push. We sit around and think, how can we help businesses? I know we can help them in the following ways, and we've gone out to give them a specific offer. I think that one of the, the trends we need to take going forward is actually to sit down with business and say, well, actually, no, how can the university help you? You know, how can, how can we shape what we do to fit your needs rather than us assuming that we understand your needs and we have a push offer to them? So I think it, it's, it, there's, there's no simple answer. I think it's about dialogue. It's about listening to them, asking them how they can help. And I think also the other bit is, is getting, I mentioned it in my presentation, is getting beyond the usual suspects. The companies that work with universities know how to engage with us and do so, but actually I, I suspect that within our region, we're probably talking to less than 10% of the businesses in the region, and it's that 90% that we need to get to. And so I think over the, in fact, when I get back to Wales on Monday, my Monday morning is a breakfast meeting with some leaders in SMEs that have not engaged with the university in the past to, to begin this dialogue, to ask them exactly, do you know what the university can do for you and how can we help you? Because we have to break through the usual suspects. Uh, the lady in yellow had a question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dawn from Nomulam University. My question is how to motivate university academics doing research, because I think that the top-down policies here really um, doesn't really work. So could you share some practical policies and experience from your institution? Thank you very much. I'll take a first shot at answering that question because I kind of alluded a little bit to it in my presentation. One of the key things is understanding how we reward university researchers um, for their output and understanding whether that reward structure works well for industry uh, and for encouraging entrepreneurial activity and for encouraging researchers to work closely with industry. And certainly in Australia, I, I think probably also in the UK and maybe in, in a lot of more developed countries, have developed a system of rewarding research based on publication and teaching, which is absolutely critical. I, I don't think we should dismiss that. But punishing people who get involved with commercialization and working with industry, where some of those activities might be a little bit restricted for a short period of time or maybe a longer period of time, and haven't, we haven't got reward structures in place that recognise the very valuable contribution that those researchers make to our community more broadly. So understanding that and trying to work out schemes and systems that reward researchers for behaving in an entrepreneurial way, I think is very important. I completely agree with that. Could I just add time? I think it is because you know research doesn't happen quickly. Uh, and often time that there isn't an immediate outcome for uh, cannot be valued. So I think on top of that, time's probably very important. I can't add much to what's been said. I think it's about having the reward systems in place, making sure that the career progression and that actually there are 
methods of rewarding through career, career progression, remuneration, all recognize that. And just the institutional values that actually within your institution that you celebrate those successes, that when people do the behaviors you want, that they're, they're promoted and celebrated within internal to the university and external to the university. Okay, we've possibly got time for one more question, if anyone's bursting to ask one. Thank you for letting me have the last questions. I would like to direct my questions to Professor David Seppert. And um, uh, I'm just curious, how do you interpret the business skill to your PhD training program? And uh, secondly, is, that, uh, is there any objection? Because I think that normally for a traditional PhD program, people just don't focus on you know, business uh, skill. So if you don't do that in your program, is there any you know, objection idea? Yes, well, I mean, I think there's an increasing awareness, certainly within the UK, that, that developing a PhD isn't just about doing the research project now, that there's wider skills. I think we talked yesterday about the T-shaped student, and I think it's becoming aware that actually just being good at research won't, won't get you far on its own. You've got to have a broader set of skills. So there's a growing awareness. But at another level, there's a rather blunt way of doing it, and actually doing the, the business training is actually a condition of the award in the first place, that actually you won't get the studentship place unless you're willing to take that. But I, I, while that sounds like a rather stick approach, I think most of the people who enter the program know what they're going into and are going to it to get those beneficial skills. Now, in terms of the delivery, uh, most of the delivery of the skills themselves is done through a series of summer, summer schools that actually um, in the first and second years, we organize an all Wales summer school where all of the KESS students converge on a, a very beautiful location in mid Wales and they spend a week together um, taking on board the, the business skills. And I actually think they benefit from that also because of the networking opportunities that come around it. So I think whilst at the outset there might be a sense that some people resist it, actually I think by the end of the program it's quite clear that actually we now have PhD students who are not on KESS programs wanting to go to the events as well because they can see and hear the benefits when those students come back to Bangor about how, how they benefit from the program. So the truth is, is that whilst we created the business awareness program specifically for the KESS studentships, it is our plan from the end of this year in the next academic year that that business opportunity we embedded into all of our doctoral training programs, but probably on a voluntary basis in the first instance. But my suspicion is the take-up will be high. Can I just second that and, and add to that? I think it's uh, something that students are now demanding rather than universities necessarily providing and forcing students to do. We, we run every year uh, some workshops around business and commercialisation and intellectual property management and identification. And we've been running those programs for probably close to eight or nine years now. And each year we, pro we have over 300 research higher degree students run through those programs. Um, the University of Queensland has a, a very structured, if you like, what they call the UQ Advantage program for their research higher degree students, which includes participating voluntarily in these sorts of workshops, but they're demanded by the students rather than necessarily forced by the university, I think. Just one point, one point to add, of course, is, is that we also provide a, an accredited award for those students completing it so that they actually get a diploma a postgraduate level diploma so that they actually have a, a definite professional qualification that recognizes their contribution 